My name is Dr. Lawrence Brock. I had a near-death experience in 1976. I do remember walking toward the door through the party, and then I don't even remember walking outside the, the house, but I have some glimpses of walking down the path toward my car. The next thing I remember, I was out of my body, floating above my car and my, phys my body. Um, I was in the white light. It was nighttime. There, the car was smashed. You know, if you'd see a picture of the car, which I used to have, but I can't find it, you'd think the person in it died because it was so smashed up. And um, my body was leaning against the tree. My legs were straight out on the ground, and I was leaning against the tree, and there was a police officer crouching over me. I assume that he pulled me out of the car, but I, don't, I never verified that. I didn't see that part. What I did see is the car smashed, my head cracked open. If you look, I still have a scar because it was cracked open all there. Um, and I was in the white light. And then behind me, there was a big circle of white, a different shade of white. Within there, there was a like a full silhouette of a person, you know, the outline and just all white of a person. Um, the feeling was the biggest thing I remember, just the feeling of love, the feeling of peace, the feeling of everything's okay. It felt even, you know, when I close my eyes and think about it, I kind of start to lift out of my body and connect into that feeling and that energy. So it was just like everything was okay and everything was good. I saw my head cracked open, it seemed fine. The car smashed, it was fine. You know, all everything in the world seemed good. I don't know how long it was. It wasn't like it was in one second, but it wasn't like for years. And in, then after a little while, the, the being behind me said, you have to go back. Your father wants you to stay. When I heard that, I knew right away the father was God, not my physical father. And so I went back into my body and came to three days later in the hospital. I have some glimpses in my memory of kind of coming up to the surface over those three days, but nothing, just like glimpses of like nurses walking around and a doctor walking around, but nothing very concrete. Uh, my understanding of what happened came after. So I had this amazing experience and like, so what? It wasn't like it is now, like you could look something up. It's not like now, like it's in movies and TV shows and books and everything. It was like I didn't know what to make of it. And I didn't tell too many people about it at all. Um, a couple of things changed about me. One is my hands, and still happens when I touch someone, become very warm. And the other, my intuition definitely increased. But I also started to meet a lot of people that had near-death experiences and other spirit, people who were interested in spiritual things. And those were, that's something that definitely happened. Um, so I was, after I got well enough, I went back to Colorado and was start to, you know, work in the restaurant again. But my life seemed less meaningful than it was before. And it was it was fun working in the restaurant. It, it's almost like playing a sport. You know, the whistle blows, the people come in, you have to rush and cook. And, you know, we would hide these little seven-inch Michelob beers behind there and bend over and drink them. And there was these big fans so you could bend down and smoke joints and stuff. And it was fun, but it wasn't very fulfilling. Um, I actually applied to go to school there and you know I was looking for more in my life and then my mother convinced me and bribed me she bought me a new car with the condition that I moved back east into Rybrook New York, Portchester turned into Rybrook New York and um, go into my dad's electrical contracting business so I did that and I got an apartment in Tarrytown New York one day after work I was sitting there you know, drinking beer, watching TV, and someone knocks on the door. And I answered it. Nowadays, you know, if someone knocks on the door, I always know who it is because someone will text before they come. But it was kind of normal back then for people to just show up. 
So I entered the door. There was this beautiful woman at the door that I did not know who she was. And she introduced herself to me and she said she was the sister of a good friend of mine that, from, that I uh, was with in Colorado. And she said, my sister told me some interesting things about you. And right away she said, I know this person who teaches about what happens after we die and I want to introduce you to him. And this was like, you know, connected to my near-death experience. And I did not use that phrase back then because I had never heard of it. And um, so she had a, a book from this guy and we started talking about this stuff. And uh, so he introduced me, she introduced me to this teacher who was a, a Sufi sheikh so of the Mevlevi dervishes. Uh, the Sufis, Sufism is the mystical sect of the Islamic religion, so he was Islamic, and it was interesting because I was born Jewish, he was Islamic, and uh, you'll see, and as I'm about to say, he started to talk to me about Mary and Jesus, and when he did, as soon as he started to say, he said Mary loved God so much and she was open to the Christ energy, when he said that, and still now I kind of get like chills inside, like, that was the energy around me. That's what I felt, that love, God's love and the Christ energy. Then he started to talk to me about Jesus, and I knew right then, that's when I knew the being behind me was Jesus in my near-death experience. So I ended up spending a bunch of years studying with him and learning stuff. And um, my, it was this process of discovery. Even though I had this teacher you know, it's again, it's not like it is today, like, oh, my hands are warm healing powers. You know, I didn't, those words didn't exist in my life, and so I started discovering things. Um, one other thing that happened with the Sufi Sheikh is, uh, like, a day, I don't remember how many days, just within a couple of days of after this woman telling me about him, I talked to him on the phone. And he did these remedies, like there are these drops in a little dropper bottle. And um, so I talked to him for a few minutes, and he said, oh, I have everything I need, which made no sense to me because we were just doing small talk. And then he sent me this remedy in the mail overnight. I got it the next day. And I knew a little bit about it because the book I read had something about this in there. And um, so I took... It said, take two drops at 10. I don't remember the exact amount of drops or time, but it, this funny schedule, take some drops at 10 in the morning, then two, then three, you know, whatever time it was, and different amount of drops. So I took the first dose. I expected something like a miracle to happen, but nothing happened. And But after the second dose, within like a minute, I started to feel something. And within a few minutes, I had a dangerously high fever. And I knew I was kind of happy. I was, you know, my mother was telling me to go to the hospital, and but I was happy because I had read in his book that it's burning off, and he calls it the dross. So like the, the unnecessary things inside of you. Um, and after a couple of days, I got better. And uh, then when I met him, he, he would always call, two, a few things happened. He would always call me a sensitive, which I knew was a, a compliment from his book again, and that that's what his teacher called him. Um, he, most questions I asked him, he would say, "You don't need to know that." And I, but I learned a lot, like through direct transmission with him. And he did teach a lot of classes. There were there were classes about what happens after we die. There were some healing classes. There were exercise classes. There was um, those are all that I'm remembering right now. One really cool thing that happened with him was in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan. Um, he was teaching this class on sacred geometry. And I wanted to take the class because I love, always love math and I love geometry. And he said, I don't, he didn't think I could keep up because everyone else in the class had been studying for years. But I, I indicated I just want to be there anyway. He said, well, you can come there and like be my assistant which was a great honor. But being his assistant just meant carrying his briefcase, sweeping the floor, 
organizing the chairs, things like that. And during one of the breaks, I was actually sweeping the floor, and he said, come here, come into my office. And I always think of that in a fond way, because he was always kind of joking around. He didn't really have an office there. There was just a room off to the side. And then he said, give me your hands, and he took his hands and squeezed mine together. He said, there, you got it. And I said, what? What are you talking about? He, said, he didn't even answer me. Then he said, nope, give me your hands again. He goes, there, you got it. And I noticed after that my intention about healing and spiritual things was much clearer, and the heat in my hands was... It wasn't hotter, but it was like I knew what to do with it a little bit more. It, something really shifted in me from that also. And I've been studying this ever since, and the part of not knowing during my near-death experience really set the tone for me to kind of know that you can never know everything spiritually, that there's always more to learn and further to go. And I've been studying, learning from a lot of people, studying my, myself, learning things from beings in the spirit, and, um, and now I get to help people do counseling and healing in this. It is miraculous. It is the coolest thing in the world, even now. Like, um, it, it thrills me. And when things happen that I help people do, it's like a miracle. And it's just the greatest thing there at times. Um, people, I'm thinking of this, I get to work with people all over the world, which I really like also, it, when people are far away. I really get a thrill when they're far away enough to, uh, like last week I had someone in Japan, so it was a different day there. And I, something about it, you know, I like science fiction, so it's uh, it's like science fiction. But uh, so there was this woman in uh, in England, in uh, in the UK, who she had a heart murmur and she had some problems with her eyes, and it was this interesting thing because she. You know, she saw me online, she wrote me an email saying, I can't really afford to see you, but, and I'm very reluctant to give people a discount, because usually people can't afford it, and they're, they're just not willing to put the money into taking care of themselves. But with this person, I had a very strong feeling to give her a discount, so I told her the price. She said, that's too much. I knew it wasn't, but then she got back to me, uh, you know, like a day or two later, and as soon as she committed to doing the session, she felt something change in her heart. And she actually went to the doctor to follow up, and he said her heart murmur was better. The other thing, and then she sent me the money, and then even before we started the session, her eyesight got much better. We did the session, she just felt so much better. It was really cool. So it's that energy that I experience in my NDE, I've learned how to, I don't call it channeling, but it is kind of like that, because it doesn't always go through me, but sometimes it does go through me and helps the person heal in really miraculous ways. I can't, couldn't be any other way. I say it's hard because it takes a lot of discipline. I mean, I'm up early every morning meditating, journal writing. I do Tai Chi and yoga usually and exercise and other spiritual things. The focus has to be helping people and you know, growing spiritually, my relationship with God, my relationship with my daughter is really important to me too, just that I love her so much. So, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work today. I was at a church. I installed uh, bars in the bathroom, you know, for people who need assistance. Meditation and journal writing are probably the two main tools for spiritual development. Um, and I so I take time to write the things that are bothering me during the day, but I'll also take time to focus on what I'm grateful for, the things that I did well, and the good things in my life. And it really gets your mind to focus on this and live your life looking for these good things, looking for these blessings that you have throughout the day with people you know, with whatever it is you do. You know, eat some good food, it's a blessing. You exercise, it's a blessing. It, life can be much better. Yeah, I love it. It's just, it's a thrill. It's, I mean, I'm so excited about still after all these years, people are looking like, are afraid when they're looking towards death. And in a certain way, I'm looking 
Not that I want to die, but I look toward it in a joyful way because I know where I'm going. I'm going to this joyful, wonderful place that there's angels and these spiritual masters that really help us. Part of the reason I like doing these videos is it's inspiring to people. It, it's even inspiring to me to hear my story because part of me lived it and part of me knows it, but I'm also, I don't know, I can look at it not egotistically like, wow, what a great experience, you know, and look at it and be even grateful for the experience. And not that I'm grateful that my head was cracked open, but I'm grateful that I had that connection with God during my near-death experience. It's really a blessing.